الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين فقال سبحانه وتعالى بعد عوض بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السابقون الأولون من المهاجرين والأنصار والذين اتبعوهم بإحسان رضي الله عنهم ورضوا عنه Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah At-Tawbah in the 100th ayah He tells us about those that are sabiqoon They are the ones that always are the first Exceeding, running, rushing To be from those who follow the guidance From those who give nusra to the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And then he tells us from who? From the people who made hijrah and who gave them nusra The muhajirun and the ansar Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about them and those who make ittiba' who follow them in their goodness that Allah is pleased with them and they are pleased with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is a very important thing for us to understand because we want to talk about uniting the Muslim ummah you want to talk about coming together but we have to lay down the foundation for unity and the foundation for unity has to be upon the first and foremost upon the kitab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If somebody curses or speaks ill about or makes takfir on or does anything else foolish like that about those that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed in the Quran that he is pleased with them, then that's a non-starter. You don't begin there. And then you are rejecting the Quran to begin with. How are you going to unite? Unity is not about numbers. If you just want to get numbers, you don't understand something. Most people are idiots. It's reality. That majority of the world are lost. They are foolish. They, they don't want to know. They don't want to care. This is a reality, whether people like it or not. You know, your, your government could be doing all kinds of things. Most people, they're just worried about what am I going to do this weekend? How am I just going to have fun? What am I going to buy? You, you can distract people. And evil people like Hitler and others who praise him and quote from him, they do that. They distract people. And then their people are just foolishly following them. Okay? So, so don't worry about big numbers. The intelligent, the thinkers are going to be few. The people on Huda are going to be few. And we've seen this throughout the history of mankind. And there are stages where you see, alhamdulillah, a lot of the world believing in stuff. But usually, the believers were going to be few. And amongst the believers, those that are worth yani, uh, the, the title of being mu'minun are going to be even fewer and muttaqoon. And muhsinun are always going to be fewer and fewer and fewer. But for us, it is our responsibility to understand and then come together upon what is right. So here, we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praises and gives the glad tiding of His pleasure to those who made hijrah for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who are they? And this is the Sahaba radi anhum that made hijrah from Mecca to Medina. And from them, the best hijrah is the hijrah of, of Abu Bakr as Siddiq. Why? Because the hijrah with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And everybody else, they went with somebody else or they went alone. But what a beautiful hijrah to make that beautiful journey, that turning point in the history of Islam that began the Islamic calendar that was such an event. And to do it with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So no doubt that is the Upmost of the Muhajirun. Yani the upper shalan of the Muhajirun is Abu Bakr as Siddiq. And those from the Ansar. And to understand this, that to love these Sahaba, to know them, to value them, to stand up for them, this is a part of our Iman. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he told us in the Hayat report by Imam al-Bukhari. And this is about the Ansar. فَقَالَ النَّبِي عَلَيْهِ سَلَطُ وَسَلَمَ Ansar. لا يحبهم إلا المؤمن. Nobody loves the Ansar except a believer. ولا يبغضهم إلا المنافق. 
and nobody has bughl against them except a munafiq. فَمَنْ أَحَبَّهُمْ حَبَّهُ اللَّهُ وَمَنْ أَبْغَضَهُمْ أَبْغَضَهُ اللَّهُ Whoever loves the Ansar, Allah loves them. And whoever hates the Ansar, Allah hates them. In Sahih al-Bukhari. Why am I mentioning this? I'm mentioning this so you can understand that this is a part of our Iman. This is not just a, a, a historic discussion. Nowadays, may Allah guide us and I have to address these issues. Nowadays we have speakers in du'aat that have programs that wallahi when I read the titles I don't understand and everybody I ask what does it mean nobody understands the meaning of it. And those that go there they come back and say well it was kind of like this and kind of like this and kind of like that. Is this a gathering to have a gathering? Is this to impress people or for people to just be entertained? But this is not the point. Our life is not for entertainment. It is for education and ibadah and getting to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the anbiya and those that are loved by Allah and the anbiya and then to follow them in their righteousness so it can lead us to be from those that are in this, in this ayah who make ittiba' of those muhajirun and ansar who follow them in their righteousness and ihsan so Allah can be pleased with us. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, when we talk about his childhood, there are not a lot of authentic narrations. And I read a few of the books and I researched some things, and you see a lot of people bring a lot of narrations, but when you look at the Sanid, they're weak or fabricated, or there is no Sanad. So people use them because they're like, it's okay, it's just, it's just history, but that's wrong. Our history has ahkam for us. And when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us Alaykum bi sunnati wa sunnatul khulafa al-rashidin al-mahdeen That means the, the actions of Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali radiyanhum They can be a hujjah yeah? So this is why we need to be careful even when we're looking in history What we know is that Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu was born two years About two years and a few months According to some of the narrations three months before Rasulullah, uh, I'm sorry, after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So this means two years and three months after Amil Fil. And we know that from the death date of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and Abu Bakr and Umar, knowing that they died at about the same age, and knowing that the Khilaf of Abu Bakr radiyan was about two years and three months. So this tells us that what we know from the authentic narrations is that Abu Bakr radiyan was born two years and three months about after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, as mentioned in the Sahih Hadith, and it's very important to understand, before Islam, before Islam, yani Islam in the sense of when the Quran was revealed. Obviously Islam has been around since the time of Adam alayhi salam, from those who submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but before the revelation of the Quran to our Nabi Muhammad sallallahu alayhi sallam, he was already somebody that had very good characteristics. And this is very important. My young brothers especially pay attention. You know, you have to be very careful of what you do. What you do every day, you have to be very careful. Because your daily actions become habits. And you have to be very careful about your habits because they become a part of your character. And when it becomes a part of your character, that becomes you. So be very careful when you joke and you lie in a joke. It's not okay to lie even if you're joking. Be careful when you joke and you pass the boundaries of Sharia. Because then you may do it once or twice or three or four times, but then it starts becoming a part of your habits. And when it becomes a part of your habits, it becomes a part of you. What we find from Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu that he had very high or very beautiful or very excellent characteristics even before Islam. So that is why when he entered Islam, he entered it the best way. And he became the best of the Sahaba because he had such a great personality as it is. And that is why sometimes when I see a non-Muslim, somebody who is not Muslim, but they have good characteristics, maybe they're honest, maybe they, they, they are caring about others, maybe they have a sense of ikram, or a sense of haya, 
We, we make dua for them. We wish that they enter Islam so those great characteristics become even better. And they become a means for them to be the best of Muslims. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, as we've seen in some of the authentic narrations, he was somebody that did not worship idols. And we'll talk about other narrations, but this is something important. He was always looking for the truth. He wanted to know what is the true religion. In the authentic narration that Ibn Kathir and others have mentioned, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was a friend to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam before Islam. And this is important. He was very close to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because their age was somewhat close and they were both people of good character and they became very good friends. So why is that important? Because when the Nabuwa came and the Quran was revealed to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Bakr siddiq radiallahu anhu, he knew Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to be honest and he knew him to be such a good person that he knew that this had to be the truth and that's why he was never hesitant about Islam in the authentic narration once Abu Bakr he heard Buhaira he was a rahib who was the one that saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he asked about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam we covered this hadith in the seerah durus he heard Buhaira ask about who is this man Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And when the Quraysh, yani they told him when he made that invitation, the food, as we covered the hadith before, and he told them that I see the trees making sujood and the rocks making sujood and the cloud covering and all the, the things that he saw, knowing that this is the Prophet of Allah, and this is before the Quran, that this is the man that will be chosen. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq who was with him. In that trip, as Imam al-Dhahabi and others have mentioned, uh, saw the Asanid with authentic narrations, that Abu Bakr radiyan was with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So even before Nabuwa, he heard of Buhaira's statement and he knew that his friend Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was somebody who there were isharat, there were signs given for him to be a prophet of Allah. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, again in an authentic narration, he heard Umayya ibn Abi Salt. Ubayya ibn Abi Salt was a poet. And he was a man that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said about him, Amanu, Amana lisanuhu wa kafara qalbuhu. That his tongue was, yani, had iman, but his heart had kufr. What does that mean? One of my own teachers, when he explained this aspect of Sirah, he explained this all in a very beautiful manner. He said, that some people, they will say something that is correct, that is so beautiful, that is so excellent, but due to either a lack of ikhlas, or due to a lack of following the truth, or having a hirs towards the haqq, their tongue will say it, but their heart will not follow it. Today, sometimes a non-Muslim will write a very beautiful book about Islam. Sometimes, yani you pick up, a book written by a non-Muslim and you're impressed at their research and how beautifully they can explain the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or some majaz in the Quran. Any, uh, I'm on these, uh, this academia.org which we discuss like, you know, uh, published papers in different universities uh, because my own work is on there. I get emails from them. I read sometimes uh, people from Germany and Scandinavia and they're not Muslim but they will do some research about the linguistics of the Qur'an, that I will be surprised, I will be shocked. But, what is good? What good is that if you don't follow it in your heart? What good is knowing the truth if you don't follow it? So this poet, he said very beautiful things. But unfortunately, he didn't follow it up. Once, he turned to Zayd ibn Amr ibn, ibn Nawfal. And Zayd ibn Amr, we spoke about him, Earlier in the Sirah Durus, he was somebody looking for the truth and he didn't worship idols and he, was, he went to Sham looking for the true religion and things. So he asked him, Umayya ibn Abi Salt, asked him, did you find the truth? Have you found it? And this is before Nabuwa. 
So Zayd ibn Amr told him, no, we went to Sham, we saw the other religions and things, but we're still waiting. So Umayyah ibn Abi Salt told him, will the last Nabi be from us or you? Yani from within the Quraysh. So Amr, Zayd ibn Amr was talking to him about this issue when Abu Bakr Radian heard this. And Umayyah ibn Abi Salt told him that do not follow the idols. And do not follow any religion except the religion of the truth because it will do you no good in front of Allah. Beautiful statement. But unfortunately, he still made shirk. But it's a, it's a beautiful statement. Now, even though the one who said it didn't practice it, but Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu, when he heard it, he said, it affected my heart. I knew that these idols were false. I knew all these religions that were made up were made up. And I was looking for that truth. And when I heard from him that was, is the last Nabi going to be from us and you, then I had this inclination that it would be from the Quraysh. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, as we mentioned, he was younger than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa There is a riwayah, and I want to clarify some things as well. And this narration I found in some of the books of tarikh where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa asked Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, who's older, me or you? And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu responded that I am older in age, but you are greater in status. But this narration has iqlab. There is a switch in the matan, and the sanad is the da'if. The authentic narration is that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa asked Abbas radiallahu anhu, the uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that who is older, me or you? Abbas radiyallahu told him, O Messenger of Allah, you are greater in status even if I am older in age. And there's two points I want to make. One, that I found some of the books. Uh, sisters, sisters, if you don't mind. Jazakumullah khairan. The first point to make here, I guess they do mind. Uh, the first point to make here is some of the books that are printed, that I found, they have this narration even though it's da'if. It's weak, it's wrong. The second is look at the akhlaq of Abbas radiallahu anhu. And he's the uncle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So he's older in age. And he's somebody very respected. But he didn't tell the Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam, yes, I'm older than you. Because the ilm that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had, the, the Quran that was revealed, the status, he said first and foremost that, O oh, Messenger of Allah, you are greater than me in status. And then he didn't lie. He didn't say, oh yeah, I'm younger than you. He told the truth, but he did it in a way of such etiquette. What happened to our etiquette today? I mean, it's something beautiful to understand. When we talk about Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, we talk about his seerah, but also his surah. What did he look like? I mean, we should, we should love the sahaba. We should love to know what they look like. We should love to know how they acted. When we talk about being you know, from those who follow the Salaf of Salihin, then first and foremost, you need to know the Salaf of Salihin. If you can't name more than 10 of the sahaba, then your empty slogans will do nothing for you. Aisha radiallahu anha, she describes her father in the Sahih Hadith. She said his face was bright with light. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was light skinned, but this is not what's being discussed in this hadith. The nur that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a person has nothing to do with their skin being light or dark. Because we find the hadith about the nur of the face of many of the sahaba that when we read their biographies, we know they were dark. So this is not about being light skinned, but being having that light, that nur of iman. You could be white as, as milk, but you could have the dhulumat, the darkness of kufr on you. So he's described as somebody having a, a great light that would be seen by those who understood iman. He was light skinned and he was skinny. Abu Bakr radiyan who had a skinny stature. He was not somebody who was wide. Like Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, he had broad shoulders, he was wide. But he was shorter in height. Abu Bakr radiyan who was tall and skinny. Aisha Taradiyan describes about him that his, his hips were slender. And that is why the hadith about the izar of Abu Bakr Radiyan that it would slip. Not that he hung it low. This is a misunderstanding. Some of the people with diseases in their heart, they misuse a hadith. Abu Bakr Radiyan, 
He, his izar would slip. Why? Because he had slender hips. And as he would be mindful, he would, he would make sure he brings it back up. Never to make isbal. But he was somebody who was slender. His hips were thin. He was tall and he was skinny. And his beard, as Aisha radiyana mentioned, the authentic hadith, that it was lighter on the sides. Yani it was not so filled. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyallahu anhu, as a sahih hadith, and we'll discuss him when we discuss his khilafah radiyallahu anhu, his beard was wide. It was so wide, as a sahih hadith mentioned, that if somebody looked at him and he had his back toward him, you could still see the sides of his beard. Ali radiyallahu anhu. But Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu, not from trimming, but from naturally, the sides of his beard were... They had less hair and it was longer towards the bottom. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu had large eyes. His eyes were bigger and he had a bigger forehead. Yani it was a, a, a forehead that stood out. His face was not chubby. It was a skinny stature of a face and he was tall. And here I will mention a saying from Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu and Umar and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Even though I will... I will, I will uh, give a warning that this saying is not checked like a hadith with a sanid and things. It's been mentioned from Ali radiyanu in some very early books, but we cannot say this is like a hadith hadith. Here, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiyanu, he was walking with Abu Bakr and Umar. Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu and then Ali radiyanu in the middle and Umar radiyallahu anhu on the other side. It's okay, leave it. So they were walking and Abu Bakr and Umar were tall. And Ali radiyallahu he was shorter. So Umar radiyallahu anhu, he turned to them and he said, Ali is between us like the noon between Lana. <laughs> and this is something beautiful. Why? Because when it shows you the Sahaba had a great love for each other. Some of the people, they tried to misuse to sh history to show a hatred which wasn't there. The Sahaba, Ali, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, they loved each other. And they had a very close relationship. And they were not depressed. And they, they knew how to joke with each other without going into bother. It's important because some people think to be religious means to be depressed. That if you're not just all the time crying in a corner and upset and angry, then you're not religious. And that's not true. Our Salaf, our earlier generations, they are our examples. And they were people who didn't go to either extreme. They wouldn't joke in the haram. They wouldn't joke in something that is fahsh. They didn't joke in something that was kadab, in lies. But at the same time, they didn't just sit around and be depressed all day. So here, Umar radiyan, he made a joke with his friends, Abu Bakr and Ali radiyallahu anhu. He said, Ali is between us like the noon in Lana. Now remember at the time, the noon had no dot either. So it's just a lamb, and then a bump, and then an alif. So Ali is between us because the two were tall. Ali radiyan, who said, that's true. And it is the noon that is important because if you take the noon out, what will you have left? La. <laughs> no, <laughs> nothing. Beautiful comeback. You know? And they all had this beautiful relationship with each other. So lana, if you take the noon out, what do you have? Lam alif la. No. What we learn from this, from understanding the physical description that Abu Bakr and Umar were both tall. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, what we know about him, is that he was somebody that was always ready to follow the truth. Even before Islam, him and Uthman and others, they were known never to have worshipped an idol. They lived amongst idol worshippers. They lived amongst people who used to worship idols. But Rasulullah himself also never worshipped an idol. So we know from a sahih hadith that Abu Bakr never worshipped an idol. And Uthman ibn Affan, and we'll study him when we get to his Khilafah. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, neither one of them ever drank alcohol. And neither one of them ever committed zina. Even before Islam. And what does that tell you? Is that he had these honorable characteristics even before Islam. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was asked in an authentic narration why he never drank alcohol before Islam. And he, many of the Sahaba drank alcohol before Islam and even in the early stage of Islam because it wasn't haram, it was not a sin. But Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu says that I didn't drink alcohol because I saw a man who was drunk. I saw a man who was drunk. 
And the Arab, they had very strong alcohol. You think today, yani the Russians and stuff, they can, they can drink. But the Arab, they loved alcohol. They had so many names for khamar and so many types because they had so many types of alcohol. So this man, he was really drunk. And, and a drunk person's a fool. It's an idiot. He doesn't know what he's doing. So what he would do is he would reach towards feces, towards poop, stool. And he would grab it, and from the drunkness, he would put it towards his mouth to eat it. But then when it came close from the smell, he would put it away. But he was so drunk, he would try it again. And Abu Bakr again, when he saw this, he says, I never want to be like this. That's a very beautiful characteristic. Where he saw a characteristic of somebody who was not fulfilling the manlihood that a man should have. The good character that a man should have. And even without Islam, from his own good goodness, from his own fitrah, he said, I never want to be like this, so he never drank alcohol. Abu Bakr radiyan, who was asked, why he never committed zina? He said, who commits zina from the people who are honorable? Yani, how can somebody who has any honor go towards zina? So these good characteristics were in Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu before Islam. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, when we talk about his characteristics, I want to mention a hadith that's in Al-Bukhari. It's an authentic hadith we discussed in the Sira Durus as well, but I'll mention some points from it from our, for our benefit. Before the Hijra to Medina, before the Hijra to Al Medina, Yathrib that became known as Al Medina, Abu Bakr radiyan, he asked permission from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi to perform the Hijra. Why? Because he loved to make Salah, and he would love to make long Salah, and this is before the regular five Salawat. But he would get up in the night and he would make the Salah, and he would recite the Quran out loud, and he had. Such yani, a, a beautiful voice, not beautiful like just in the way that he recited, but in the feelings that he had with the Quran, that it would affect the Quraysh. And when they would hear it, their children, their women that were passing by, that would hear it, they would start to come towards Islam by hearing the Quran, the words of Allah, at the lisan of a Siddiq radiallahu anhu. The Quraysh, they said, you cannot read the Quran out loud. They put Restrictions on him. So Abu Bakr again, he loves Salah so much, he loves Quran. He asked Abu Bakr, he asked Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, "Let me make Hijra, let me go to Abyssinia, because I cannot not make Salah, I cannot not recite the Quran." So Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam gave him ijazah, and when he was on his way to Habasha, he stopped in a place that is close to where. Yamama and Yemen and these areas are today and it's called Bark uh, Ghimad Bark al Ghimad in this area where he stopped he met a man Ibn Daghina al Daghina was his father's name he was the son of al Daghina Ibn al Daghina as mentioned al Bukhari some other names have been given to him but this is the strongest of the narrations Ibn al Daghina was somebody who knew Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu and when he saw him, he didn't know about his Islam, but he knew who this man was. He told him, where are you going? He told him, my people have kicked me out, and they have made me leave. And he told him, how can somebody like you be kicked out? You are somebody, la yakhruj wa la yakhraj. What does that mean? Somebody like you cannot be expelled by his people and he should not leave his people because you have such good characteristics and what does that tell you this hadith tells you that before Islam Abu Bakr radiyan was known far and wide for his good character and then he mentioned some of them and I will mention them in, in summary that you are the one who helps a people earn a living and I'm, I'm going to summarize a lot of this here because this is just to give you an understanding of his character. There is a difference between somebody who gives sadaqah, just gives somebody some money, and somebody else who helps somebody earn. Do you understand? Yani somebody may be leaving a masjid, for example, after Jama'ah, and they see somebody in need. Not the frauds that you see nowadays, but somebody who's really in need. And they, they get a soft, soft spot in their heart, and they give them like $10. Alhamdulillah, it's good, it's sadaqah. But somebody else may see somebody like that, 
and tell them, look, let me give you some money so you can start a business. Let me go and try to fix your resume so you can get a job. Let me go and take you to a brother who can maybe help you get a job. So which one is more important? And in English we have a saying, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. You teach a man to fish and you feed him and you, for a lifetime. Something like that. Right? So Abu Bakr was from those people that he didn't just help the poor, but he helped them by trying to get them up and running so they would no longer be in need. That's a very beautiful characteristic. He said about him that you are the one that keeps the family ties. You are the one who helps those that can't help themselves. And that's a very important thing. We'll talk about how he used to free the slaves and what happened between him and Bilal radiallahu anhu and how he helped him. But he was somebody that would sacrifice his wealth to help others that were in need. And you are the one that provides shelter and food for those that are guests. I mean, this is a very important characteristic that we have lost today. Ikram al duyuf This is from Islam to feed and to house and to take care of our guests. If a Muslim comes to a town, it is the haqq of that Muslim that we keep them in our houses for three days, feeding them and sheltering them. That is their haqq. That is not ikram. And subhanallah, today, if somebody comes to our house and we give him a, a cup of water from the sink, we think, alhamdulillah, and I'm such a great host. Subhanallah, if you don't have a place in your house for the guests, I mean, this is something you're lacking. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us that, that if somebody builds a house and they keep a room empty for the guests, this is not israf. But if you keep an extra one after that, then this is for the shaitan. Today we build rooms for useless things in our house. This is my trophy room. Trophies for what? This is my game room. I put my pool table there. What? But if a guest comes, oh, I'm sorry, let me, let, me, uh, let me drive you to the hotel. How's that? Oh, Jazakallah khair. Great ikram there. But Abu Bakr radiyan was from those that even before Islam, he would treat the guests, he would feed the guests, he would make ikram for them, he would take care of them. And this is a great quality that he had. He said about him, that he you are a man that helps those that nobody helps in the harshest times. It's a very beautiful statement. Yani, sometimes when things are easy, everybody's willing to help. I'll give you an example. Right now, if one of you, uh, may Allah protect you all, but let's say your car doesn't start or something, and another brother may come and say, I'll give you a jump. Alhamdulillah, this is good. You're trying to help somebody. But if you see... Yeah, I need 20, uh, let's say, gang members about to attack a Muslim brother with guns and knives. You may be like, ah, let me call the police for you. <laughs> now, you don't want to put yourself at harm. But there is a difference, yeah, need, and this is the thing, to help somebody in ease is easy. But to help somebody in hardship, when it becomes a hardship on you, this is hard. And this is the way of the Sahaba, that they would sacrifice themselves. And, and something amazing... Even the non-Muslim from the Arab had that quality. You know when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa came back to Mecca, in the earlier times we talked about this, there was a non-Muslim who gave protection, and him and his sons with swords in hand went with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa entering Mecca, telling the Quraysh that he's under our protection, we will fight to protect him. A non-Muslim was willing to give up his life and his children's lives for his honor. And here... The same thing, he went back with Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu to Mecca and gave protection and went to the Quraysh and said, under my protection, you will allow him back into Mecca. And this shows you a good characteristic that unfortunately we have lost today. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, as mentioned in the Sahih Hadith, Sa'ad radiallahu anhu was asked, why was Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu's Islam so strong? Was it because he was the early Yani from the early Muslims. Is that the reason? Sa'ad radiallahu anhu said no. Sa'ad ibn Waqat radiallahu anhu. He says, دخل الإسلام أحسن الدخول. Yani, وإسلامه أحسن الإسلام. 
He says he entered Islam the best way. And his Islam was the best Islam. In the sharh of this hadith, one of the shiukh that I listened to and I, I sat with and I studied with, he said about this hadith, that what does it mean that when he came to Islam, he brought those characteristics with him that were the characteristics of Islam and he entered fully. He never doubted. He never had to think twice about Islam. And that is a key characteristic that differentiates Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu from others. Yaqeen. Firm belief. Never doubtful. When he entered Islam, he didn't think twice. When the news of Israel al Mi'raj came, he believed in it without thinking twice. Everybody else had to think. He entered Islam full heart, fully, with yaqeen. And when he entered Islam, he made Islam his best, meaning he didn't leave out any aspect of Islam. His Islam was the best in every aspect, in sadaqah, in jihad, in dhikr, in ilm, in, 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 in khidmah, in, in akhlaq, in everything, he went to the top. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Sahih Hadith after a salah he turned to the Sahaba radiallahu anhum and he told them about a news from the nations before us from something that happened in the umam in the nations before us and he told them it's a long hadith I will, I will summarize here about a shepherd who found a wolf that had snatched a sheep. And when he freed his sheep, the wolf spoke. And he told the shepherd, what will you do about the day when there are no shepherds and we are the shepherds of the wolf for the sheep? And so it's a big, very deep hadith. If I went into the sharh of it about the alamat al and thing, it would take a long time. But he told the Sahaba about what had happened. The Sahaba, they had, I mean, they were amazed by this. They believed it, but they were amazed. They said, oh, Messenger of Allah, a wolf that speaks. And it's something amazing. If I came and told you guys that I was coming from Yuma and, and, and a coyote came up to me and spoke to me, you guys would be like, man, I think the sheikh started that, uh, went to the wrong pharmacy. The one with the green cross on it. <laughs> he was going to the masjid up in Mira Mesa and he went, took the wrong way and went up to the pharmacy. And instead, you wouldn't believe me. Right? Because something amazing. But this is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So Sahaba, they believed, but they were amazed. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, I believe this, and Abu Bakr and Umar believed this. Then he told them about a cow that a man was riding on. He was using it as a riding animal. And the cow, it spoke. And it told the man that Allah didn't create me for this. And Allah created subhanahu wa ta'ala the cattle like the bull and things to to work on the land or to give milk or other reasons but or to eat alhamdulillah but not to be used for for riding on so the cow he told the man this is not allah created you you're misusing me so sahaba radiyallahu they were amazed they said oh my of allah a cow that speaks rasulullah sallallahu alayhi said i believe this and abu bakr and umar they believe this and the Sahaba radiallahu anhu said that when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was telling us this, Abu Bakr and Umar were not there in the gathering. They were not sitting in the gathering. But this was the yaqeen and the iman of Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhu that even when they were not there, even though they had not heard this news yet, but Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knew that when they heard it, they would believe it without doubt. So he he said, I believe in this, and Abu Bakr and Umar believe in this. We need to understand these Sahih Ahadith to understand the status of these Sahaba. Radiallahu anhum. One of the characteristics of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhum, is that he was very calm in the face of hardship. He was the one that stabilized the Ummah in the time when things were falling apart, when the people were becoming murtad. When the people were leaving zakat, when the people were in shock after the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he was the one that was firm for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa taala, and this is a very good quality. 
My brothers and especially my sisters in Islam, listen to this. And when a calamity hits, the one who freaks out, the one who loses it, is not the one who's going to help. What does that help? And what does it help if you freak out? Some hardship comes and you start crying and whipping and you lose your mind and you're, you're throwing your clothes and you're ripping. What does that help? The one that is firm and patient has sabr and does what is right is the one who helps the situation. So even in the face of great hardship, you need to be patient. You need to not lose your cool. And this was a characteristic of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. What is interesting is when he radiallahu anhu was asked himself in the Sahih narration that how is it that you are so calm in the harshest of situations. He radiallahu anhu says that when I was with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in Al-Ghar, in the cave, and we talked about this in the last daf, he said at that time I had anxiety and I was concerned but Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told us, inna, he told me, inna allaha takaffala hada deen bi timam. Yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take this religion to the point that it is complete. It will reach everywhere. It will be completed. Abu Bakr radiyan said, after I heard that and I knew this religion would not end, I never was concerned after that. What does that tell you? He was not concerned about his own safety, his own life, the life of his children, the life of his wife, the life... No. He was concerned about the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And once he knew that Allah will protect the deen, then he was steadfast, he was calm in every hardship. Today, we are concerned just about ourselves. May Allah forgive us. If we are comfortable, we don't care about anything else. Kufr happens, we don't care. Shirk happens, we don't care. Somebody distorts the religion, we don't care. Ahkam of the deen are broken, we don't care. We will sit next to somebody and laugh and joke and, and, and light candles who, who is making shirk with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we will say, he's going to heaven too. Why not? Because we, are not, we don't have ghira for the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the weakness of our yaqeen and iman. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu had taqwa, had zuhud in his character. What does that mean? Does that mean he was just broke? Does that, was that what zuhud means? You just don't have anything? No. He didn't love the dunya. May Allah forgive us. Today we all think, and whether we say it or not, and I'm saying with me first before you, we think we have a guarantee to Jannah in our back pocket. That death will come, and we'll go on the day of judgment, and we'll pull that out. Hey, I'm a Muslim. Hey, look. And we call, oh, mashallah, khalas, you, you're in Jannah. Abu Bakr siddiq radiallahu anhu was given the guarantee of Jannah upon the lisan of a Nabi alayhi salatu salam repeatedly. We'll talk about those ahadith and when they happen. But even then he had taqwa, he had zuhud, he had that love for akhirah, he had that fear, that awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That in one of the ahadith, he said, I wish, he saw a bird. He was in a garden, he saw a bird. He said, how fortunate is this bird? I wish I was like this bird that flies around and he doesn't worry about being questioned on the day of judgment. Subhanallah. And you think about, do me and you worry about what will happen when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes me to account on the day of judgment? And look at the sins we have. Did any of us, any of us sitting here, raise your hand if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa told you personally by name that you have a guarantee to be in Jannah? Raise your hand. And if you do, there are some brothers that want to talk to you outside. None of us. Abu Bakr radiyan had that, but he didn't become negligent. His heart had that khawf from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he saw this bird, he said, how lucky is this bird, it flies around. It doesn't have that worry about the day of judgment. It will be eaten, it will be gone, it will be done, and it's done. In another hadith, he said, I wish I was like the blade of grass that is cut and done away with. 
but will never have to answer in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment. Another hadith, he said, I wish I was like a tree that is cut and done away with. And I will not have to answer in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And similar hadith are mentioned from Umar and Uthman and Ali radiallahu we will mention when we discuss their khilafah. Even though he was somebody the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said about him that every gate of Jannah will be calling out for him. Subhanallah. From the characteristics of Abu Bakr Siddiq, and pay attention my brothers and sisters, he was very afraid of giving a fatwa. Today, bil asaf al-shadeed, with great sorrow I have to say, that every Muslim, unfortunately, who may not even know the basics of Islam, thinks they know everything. They think they, will, they know everything. And the regular Muslims, unfortunately, are careful about where they get medical knowledge. And today, from and all these brothers here, mashallah, raise your hands when I ask the question. If you had, may Allah protect you all, and may Allah give you the best of health. Let's say you had a, a very uh, infectious kidney pain disease, or you had cancer or a heart problem. Which one of you would let me, Uthman, take an, my kitchen knife and operate on you? Raise your hands. None? Good. <laughs> Why? I'm not a doctor. I, I don't even know much about science or medicine or those kinds of things. Who would you go to? You would go to a doctor. Which doctor? You would go to the best doctor. You wouldn't go to just any doctor. You're going to check reviews. You're going to check ratings. You're going to check. You're going to ask around who's really good. And then you're going to want to question that doctor even. Are you sure? What kind of tests do I need? And you may even get a second opinion in this. And you're worried about going to the best medical institutes and facilities. And then you're going to get that medical treatment. But when it comes to fatwa, you will go to a, a guy who's never studied sharia, just because he may lead salah somewhere, or maybe just because he has a beard, or maybe just because he knows a couple of words in Arabic, and you're like, uh, how do you do this? Like this, all right, I'm good. Why? Because we care about our health, but we don't care about our iman. Because we care about our physical body, but we don't care about our ruh. And when somebody asks you a question, you will know nothing about it. And you'll say, I think it's halal. Why not? <laughs> um, it looks haram to me. <laughs> in my country, they don't do it like that, so I think it's wrong. Yeah. I was in the haram and I saw somebody doing it like that, so I think it's okay. Why? If you don't know, stay quiet. Who asked you to answer? But Abu Bakr radiyallahu, when he was asked a question as a Sahih hadith, it mentions, he would, when he would ask a religious question, he would start to sweat. He would be concerned, even though he had all this knowledge. And he would always, first and foremost, go back to the kitab of Allah. In Sahih narration, Ibn Sa'ad has it in Tabaqat, and al Zahbi and others have mentioned as well, that he would go back to the kitab of Allah. He would always want to see if the answer is in the book of Allah. And if he didn't, he would go to the other Sahaba and he would ask them that, I heard this from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What did you hear? And he wanted to confirm what they had from the Sahih, yani what we know from the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if not, he would go to the knowledgeable Sahaba and he would ask their opinions, even though we know he was the best of this Ummah. He wouldn't just answer. And this is important for us. Even if you are an alim, even if you are a mufti, even if you are a sheikh of Islam and this and that, Always make sure before you answer to go back and check. And that's not a, a sign of ignorance. If you go back to the books, that doesn't mean you're ignorant. It means you're careful. And you need to be careful with the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he was very careful about halal and haram. And this is something we're very important for this ummah today. Today we're very lax about these issues. Very lax. I mean, we, we know, for example, a certain meat is haram because the way it's shot and killed. 
But just because some guy somewhere said it's okay, we're like, oh, well, that's what I heard. No, 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 no. I don't want to hear anything else. No, 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 no. How do you be careful about these issues? Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he used to have somebody that he used to work with. And he had a business deal where he, the person would use his wealth and he would do business and he would bring back yani, something from the prophets and things. And once, when he brought something to him, which was a bowl of milk, he drank from it. Because he had a business. And, and you need to understand this hadith. I mean, I had heard it many times, but when I actually looked at the longer narrations, there's a depth to it. For example, if me and... Uh, uh, I won't mention any particular brother, I don't want to offend anybody, but let's say brother Muhammad, we do business together. And the business agreement is that whatever profits you have, you bring me a part of it. So I have to be under the assumption that whatever he brings me is halal, because it's from the business that we're doing together. And this is a kind of assumption. But Abu Bakr when he got this milk and he drank it, even after that, out of his taqwa, he asked him, where did you get this milk? Even though regularly, it would be from the business earnings. So this man, he told Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, that this time, I wasn't able to get the milk as regularly through our business agreements. So what I did, is I had some milk from the old days, that I had got from before I became Muslim. And I had got this wealth, I mean I had got this wealth and I bought the milk from it. And this was from a time when I used to fortune tell. When I used to be a fortune teller. You know, when you go to the Muslim lands, you'll see those Najumis, you know, that, that big hand they have, that tell you, oh, this, this finger and this line and this. This is shirk. You cannot go to this. This is shirk. Even if you go to one without the intent of believing them, even if you just go for entertainment, this is haram. And there are a hadith about the, the wa'id and things that I'm not going to go into, but even that is not permissible. And if you believe in this stuff, oh, you're a Virgo. Oh, you're a Cancer. May Allah not give us Cancer. I don't know why you want to be a Cancer. Oh, you're a Spices or Species or whatever made up Greek shirk that they have. Today, Muslim countries, they have it in the newspaper. Oh, if you're a Virgo, it's a good day for you because you're the... Na'udhu billah. Shirk. So, this man used to do this before Islam and he had some wealth from that and from that he got the milk. Now, what is the fatwa on that milk for Abu Bakr? It's halal. He didn't know. Yani if somebody uh, comes up to me right now and tells me, brother, I have this halal sandwich and he gives it to me and he's a good Muslim brother and then you know, in reality he slipped in some pork or whatever. It's not on me, it's on that fool. Right? It's halal for Abu Bakr. He didn't know. He had a halal business agreement. He was under the assumption. He drank it. And he already drank it now. What did he do? He made himself throw up. Did he have to? No. But this is the difference between fatwa and taqwa. There is the fatwa and there is taqwa. And this is from the taqwa of Abu Bakr radiyan, he made himself throw up. And Shaykhuna Abu Muhammad, he said about this something beautiful. He said the example of haram is like poison. Yani if you drink poison on accident, is it a sin? And if you take poison to kill yourself, it's haram. Suicide is haram in Islam. But if you didn't know and you drink it, is it a sin? No. Is it going to harm you? Yes. And that's the harm with haram. Today we're very lax about this. But the Sahaba were very careful about this. They didn't want even Abu, Abu Hanifa, the great scholar from the Salaf. We talk about the Salaf, he was from one of the uh, imma of the Salaf. Nu'man ibn Thabit, radiallahu anhu. Once, as mentioned in Manaqib Abi Hanifa by Mullah Liqari, they said once a goat or a sheep, it was stolen in Kufa. When Abu Hanifa heard about this, he asked the people, how long is the average life of a sheep like this? And when he was informed, he stopped eating sheep meat for that time period, afraid that by accident, he may eat the meat of a sheep that is haram. Even though it's not a sin on him. But this is from the zuhud, the wara, the taqwa of Abu Hanifa. And this is from the taqwa of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. 
when we look at the taqwa of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, we see from it his ability to keep secrets. From the characteristics and taqwa is to keep a secret. And this is very important today because today we are unfortunately sometimes very lax with this issue. We know something about somebody and we're quick to expose it. But Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he was very good at this. And I'll mention the hadith about this. Umar radiallahu anhu, his daughter Hafsa, she became a widow. And think about this. She was very young, but she became a widow. And Umar, he didn't want his daughter to just be living by herself. The Sahaba, they didn't want women to be in that state where they don't have a husband. So he didn't just have pride and say, no, I'm just going to sit around and until somebody begs me for my daughter and then I'm going to say no and then they're going to beg me, then I'll say no again, then they're going to... No. He went to Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu and he told Abu Bakr Siddiq that I have my daughter, you should marry her. Subhanallah. And he looked at the Sahaba and look at us. Which one of us today would do this? To go up to somebody and say, and somebody your age, <laughs> to say, go marry my daughter. And Abu Bakr radiyani, him and Umar radiyani are close in age. Another two years, uh, uh, some, uh, another ten years, Abu Bakr radiyani is older. But even then, Umar radiyani, he went to a man older than him, and he told him, I have my daughter, marry her. Now Abu Bakr radiyani knew that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa had made an intention to honor Umar and his daughter and make her from the Ummahat al mumineen but he didn't expose the secret of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Even though Rasulullah didn't tell him, keep this on the hush. <laughs> but this is from the honor that Abu Bakr radiyan had in his fitra. And he didn't make up a lie either. He didn't lie. He just stayed quiet. And Umar radiyan became upset. He said, why are you quiet? Like either say, no, I don't want to marry her. Or accept her. Now, Abu Bakr radiyan, he didn't want to yani, say that he didn't want to because they loved the Sahaba, they loved each other. They didn't marry just for the girl or just for the man. They loved for the piety of that family. So he didn't want to say no. But he also didn't want to expose the secret, so he kept quiet. Umar radiyan, he went to Uthman ibn Affan. Again, same thing, marry my daughter. Imagine, these are the most honorable people. If you want to know what honor is, it was them. And he went, he told Uthman radiyan, marry my daughter. Uthman radiyan said, I have no need to marry right now. He didn't lie either. But he, he refused in a different way. Then Umar says, I was more upset with Abu Bakr than Uthman. At least Uthman gave me a reason. Abu Bakr just kept quiet. Like, what is this? Until Rasulullah sallallahu news reached Umar and he was the happiest of people that his daughter became for Ummahat al Mu'mineen. And he said, Then I understood. And then Abu Bakr came to me and apologized and told me, Umar, it is not that I wanted to, to show disrespect, but it's because I could not expose the secret of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa I will end here today, even though yani when we speak about Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, there is so much to speak about him and his characteristics. But for a sense of time, I will end. And inshallah, at the next stars, we'll start to begin with the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and how the Khilafah of Abu Bakr radiyallahu actually began. But we hope that everybody will be steadfast in coming to these durus and learning about our Salaf, as salihin and following them in their footsteps and clarifying these issues. Jazakumullahu khairan.